Hello, I'm Richard Vobes, the Bald Explorer, and this is another of my story episodes. These have been very popular and people have encouraged me to keep going with the story of my life, uh, my heritage, if you like. So uh, now, got to try and sort of get uh, a few little recaps in this so that we can take the story a bit more forward. Um, now, you may think, first of all, that, uh, well, if I was interested in filmmaking and writing and scripts and television and all of that, why didn't I go to film school? Or why did I not go to drama school? And I didn't do either of those things. I think because of um, an independent spirit that was deep within me. You see, my, my mum was an orphan and she didn't have any parents. Well, she had parents, but uh, that was a, a, another story. Um, but uh, they had put her into, or her mum, who was a single parent, had put her into an orphanage. So she grew up very much independent of things and had a very independent spirit. My dad, well, he, he um, was a bit of a loner and he set up his own business um, when he was in his, I think it was in his late forties. And for the rest of his life, he again did thing his own way. And that's uh, how I really pictured my dad. And I think that independent spirit stayed with me as somebody who did their own thing. They foraged their own um, furrow, as it were. So they dug their own furrow, farrow. anyway, whatever. Uh, <laughs> And I think that's, that was me. Everybody was going to drama school. It was the, the done thing. Um, and um, I didn't want to be a small cog in a large machine. Uh, I guess there was a sense, a little bit of arrogance in me as well as the independence perhaps. And so I'd shunned those things. Um, but I was interested in doing something a bit different. and. As you may remember, I used to teach at uh, Lodge Hill with this uh, Czechoslovakian mime artist called Yuri Stanislav. And uh, he hadn't taught us all these mime things, that, um, that the tricks, if you like, and the articulations and all of those sort of things that we I subsequently learnt. And so I did want to go to mime school. But before all of that, let me just remind you, I lived in, I'd run away from home when I was 18 and I stayed in Petworth and I'd got involved with the Gratham Youth Theatre um, and we put on plays and um, I was living there for a while for about two years and then I moved back down to Horsham to stay with my mother back in the, the family house. My parents had split up when I was 10 and I'd helped my friend Barbara, who I had met when I first left school to go and work in a printing company, to set up her own print company. And we'd I'd gone there and helped buy this, uh, or choose the machine that they used and help her get going for about three months. Then my mum uh, wanted to sell the house and she wanted to go around the world on a, I think a three to six month cruise and travelling expedition, which she did. And I had bought a Morris Traveller and moved down to stay with my dad. And on the route down, the wheel collapsed and the crock pot hit me on the head and I went through the window. Um, so I was down at my dad's at that point. Living with my dad, uh, now he was somebody, he'd split up from the family when I was 10. And I, this was, well, this must have been 11 years later. I must have been about 21 at this point and it was awkward he didn't really know how to cope with me he found this extra person in his house he was living down in Goring at the time very awkward um, it didn't really work very well but I had managed so I stayed in one little room and I slept on the floor actually it just seemed easiest than trying to get a bed and everything because it was quite a tiny little room and I managed to get a job at Marks and Spencers in Worthing. So this was just a filling shelves and having shifts on the old tills back in the day. And I did that for about a month or so. And I was, you know, it was just a 
something to earn money and then in between times I was on my typewriter back in the day typing out my scripts and things and I didn't have a car so I was desperately trying to earn some money to to do all that and I applied at the same time for mime school the Desmond Jones School of Mime and fortunately because I had been at Lodge Hill and I knew George Rawlings the county drama advisor very well and I had been doing a lot of teaching and a lot of uh, the courses there and was helping out pretty much all the time they ran any of these courses uh, he arranged for a, um, a bursary I suppose it is a grant of I think it was about 550 pounds to go on the three-month mime course that Desmond Jones had in Shepherd's Bush in London. Now if I remember rightly this was going to be the following April so here we were in about um, November, September, October, November time and I got this and the course was going to start if I remember rightly in April and I was working at Marks and Spencer so this was just a stopgap really to do something in the meantime. Well that was going all reasonably well and I was quite excited that I had the that I had could get in and then all of a sudden I was called in um, to uh, this was in November called into the office at Marks and Spencer's because um, they wanted to talk to me so I went up to the office and saw I guess what would be uh, I'm not sure they called it HR then the human resources department but I saw the boss lady there and uh, she sat me down in the office and she said I'm sorry Richard but we're going to have to let you go and I thought what, what do you mean why she said well it's a bit unusual but uh, you've been too friendly with the customers now not friendly as in you know what kind of friendly but just being friendly she said you're taking too long on the tills not that people were queuing because if people were queuing I wouldn't be but I, I it's true I did used to chat to people and have a natter when we were doing these things uh, when I was on the, on the tills and look at the food because I was just very engaging or I was overly helpful packing the shelves and I thought this was a bit odd because especially now when service is very much the thing that everybody wants to try and help people understand how to do but back then in um, well this was the 80s the sort of early 80s it it was um, I think it was frowned upon they just wanted to, you know people to come in and get the stuff and go so I said to them instead of sacking me is there any chance that you could transfer me and they said well what do you mean I said you've got um, a Marks and Spencer's in London um, probably several of them is there any chance I could go and work there and they said oh why is that I said well I'm thinking of moving to London actually and they said yeah okay so amazingly they instead of sacking me they transferred me now at the time Christmas was coming and they knew Christmas was coming so they got in touch with the Oxford Street branch didn't they um, one of the biggest ones and I <laughs> sent me <laughs> sent me up to that one and I had a, about a, a week's grace or something like that before I was then due to work at the Oxford Street one over the Christmas period so that was um, a baptism of fire I can tell you but the thing was I knew some friends who I had met in uh, Petworth who were moving to London and they had got the ground floor of an old Victorian house and I got in touch with them and they said yeah look, look you can stay with us and so there, I think there was something like three or four rooms uh, I think there must have been three rooms and four of us so for a short period whilst I was then to go and find somewhere of my own to, to live at my own place one of them said look I've got a big room we can separate it with a curtain which was basically blankets and we, we did do that so I moved up to London moved out from dad moved up to London not with very much stuff and we separated this room with blankets and I went to work at Marks and Spencer's now I lived in this house at Muswell Hill near the Alexandra Palace which was fascinating and I would get on the tube and go down to Oxford Street and go and work at uh, Marks and Spencer's which was about three times as big as uh, the one in Worthing 
and three times as busy. So there was no chance of being too friendly with any of the staff. I mean, people were coming and going and it was full on, especially at Christmas time. It was, it was really quite a, a, an eye opener for me because uh, Oxford Street was just always heaving. It never seemed to stop and people were in and out like nobody's business. And the two things really that I remember about the Marks and Spencer's store that st stuck in my mind. I mean, everybody was friendly enough and, and I just slotted in because I had had the experience down in Sleepy Worthing. I just upped my game a bit. Um, one thing was at the back of the store, if you needed to go up and down because it was on several floors, if you needed to go up and down and fetch something or go to a different floor for whatever reason, they had this thing at the back called the Paternoster. And this was a, a lift mechanism not um, a lift that has doors that, that slide shut like this. This just had a moving floors that came up like this. So each floor would keep coming up like this and then I guess somehow would fold up and go back down again. So there, were the, there was one of these that was continually going up like this and another one next to it that was continually going down. As I say, no doors. So you had to, you just would see the floor coming up and you would just step onto it and it would take you onto the next level and you would leap off. Same going down and you would just step up and you got used to it very easy. You just judged it and got on it. Now, I imagine for health and safety reasons, something like that has uh, since been outlawed. I can't imagine that they still have that sort of thing. So that was one. And I loved going into the Paternoster. Uh, it was great fun. The other thing was um, often I would be on the till and you, you know, people would come past. And then one day there was this woman that, that was on the till and I looked at her and I thought, I know you. And it was Gloria Honeyford, who was a presenter, morning presenter on BBC Radio 2 back in the, in the 80s. And she was very famous for that show. And she came, I can't remember what she bought, but I do remember looking at her and thinking, yeah, I know you. And I served her and was very polite, but I didn't do the old thing. Oh, you're Gloria Honeyford, can I have your... But I was a little bit, wow, you know, I met somebody famous. Um, so that was quite nice. But, um, so I was killing that job, but unfortunately I was struggling to find somewhere else to live. And another friend of mine said, well, we live in a, flat, in a house in, um, I think it was Palmer's Green, if I've got that right, off the uh, North Circular Road. Well, it turns out that this place, because I had to move out of the Muswell Hill one, turns out that this place was uh, a squat. And I didn't realise really that it was a squat until I got there. And they said, well, it is a squat. You've got this room. Uh, and it's your room, and it was, a, again, a pokey little room, and I s slept on a, uh, a very thin little mattress on the floor, but they advised me not to leave anything valuable in the house. Well, I didn't really have very much in those days uh, because I was sort of killing time, really, trying to, most of my stuff was uh, in storage. Um, my mum had put it in storage when I, uh, or no, it was at my father's, of course it was, it was still at my father's in storage in his loft. Um, so I was pretty much just living out of a suitcase. And so that was fine. Um, but what I hadn't realized, and it was quite exciting, you know, living with some friends who were living in a squat and all that, and there was nothing anybody could do. And there you were, you'd come and go. And I didn't really know much about how it all worked. Um, and then my friend, pretty much the first week uh, that I was there left and I was left with these other strange people who I didn't really know they weren't really my type and they were smoking all sorts of weird stuff and and doing various things and I was mu very much isolated from that I didn't like that then and um, I got out of there probably I probably only stayed there for two weeks in this squat but I would still be going down to um, the the, the supermarket down in uh, the Marks and Spencer's down in um, Oxford Street. Um, and so I did all that, but eventually I couldn't stand the squat anymore. And we were coming up towards the beginning of my new uh, mime school term. So I left that and my mother, uh, oh, the sun has just gone in, sorry about that. My mother had um, come back from her round the world trip and she'd got a job uh, in a little 
she'd got a flat, she got a little flat and she got a job locally as a carer looking after elderly people who, who needed uh, you know, someone to come in and look after them. And so she had this little flat in Little Haven, which is a place uh, just close to Horsham, just on the outskirts of Horsham and, and sort of on the way to Crawley, but it's got a station. So she said, well, why don't you stay here temporarily until you find something? So I stayed there I can't remember if I had a room or I stayed on the floor now uh, because I was barely there. I would uh, be there again with very few belongings and Mime School, Mime School started and I'll talk about Mime School in the next video on this series but essentially what I would do is I would get up in the morning, catch the train at the crack of dawn, go up to Victoria, go on the central line to Shepherd's Bush, walk to uh, the Mime School um, Hall, I'll tell you all about that later on, and do the course which lasted until lunchtime, go off in the afternoon to a little supermarket whose name I cannot remember but it was like Little Woods but it wasn't Little, maybe it was Little Woods but not Little Woods as in the, sh the, the um, it was something like that, I can't remember, like the, the uh, pre not premium bonds, the football pools, Little Woods but not that. And it was like a sort of half chemist, half shop. Did that till the evening, got back on the uh, underground, got back on the last train down to Lit Little Haven, crashed out on my mum's floor, only to get back up, whiz up to mime school. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so in the next episode, I'll tell you all about mime school um, but for now, that sort of bridges the gap, really, in that uh, wondrous years in London. And let me tell you, I hated living in London, even though I had my friends, but I barely saw them. And I felt, I've never felt so lonely in a place. So many people, so many busy people, but I've never felt more lonely in my life than when I lived in London. And nothing would induce me to live there again now. But that will be for the next one. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to follow, like and subscribe. If you've enjoyed it, do leave a comment. Uh, sorry about the sun coming in and out. I <laughs> can't help that. Um, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>